Stallman. A pleasure. Hello, Eric. Hey How there, Mark. You? Mark Stallman of the Center for Digital Life. Center for the Study of Digital Life. Study of Digital Life. And Mark, you're one of my favorite McLuhan scholars because you, you have good ideas, but also the times that I don't agree with you, I get into a long process of figuring out exactly how and why that is. And I end up considering any idea that you might present so carefully to analyze why I might not agree with assuming I might not understand it, right? When I, when I, when I think of agreement, I think it's overrated. So I, I assume that agree, lack of agreement is actually a lack of understanding. So by the time I'm done, I at least understand what the heck you're talking about. Or I hope. Lack, lack of agreement is an invitation to dialogue. And that's the reason why I do my best to never argue with anybody. Yeah, good, good. So my first question for you is where are we right now? 2023, June 2nd, we are located uh, in a remarkable maelstrom. As you recall, uh, Marshall McLuhan uh, promoted uh, a 1843 short story by Edgar Allan Poe, Descent mm -hmm. into the Maelstrom. Yes, I have read that in, in pursuit of understanding McLuhan. I have studied that story. Well, McLuhan lived in a maelstrom, which he uh, was very well aware of. Um, the, the maelstrom for McLuhan was one where he was a Catholic uh, convert in a, in a very uh, irreligious uh, age, television. Yep. Uh, he became, uh, in many ways, the expert on television, but he was well aware that that uh, particular paradigm uh, raised all kinds of problems. And in particular, he did not write for a Catholic audience <clears throat> in any of the major publications, books, articles, with the sole exception of a magazine called Renaissance out of uh, Marquette University. And there he, in fact, joined the board of editors. So he was keenly aware that the audience is the formal cause of any work of art. And so therefore, if you read McLuhan, you will not understand what he really is saying unless you first of all understand that he is posing for an audience. He is posing for an audience. Right. Is, is this the kind of put on that he talks about? Yes, exactly. You put on your audience. So this is, this is the joke about how the strippers don't take off their clothes, they put on their audience. <laughs> You know, my, my dad uh, was a, uh, he's a PhD in media studies at NYU uh, from the Postman era, but I don't think he actually took a class with Postman. So he's not a Postmaniac. But one, one time I've had some, I've had some absolutely transcendent moments of media study with my dad, which were completely serendipitous and like uh, emergences of, uh, uh, spontaneous emergences of something. And one time he pulled out an old videotape of McLuhan speaking about the Beatles playing at Shea Stadium in 1965. Right. And, and we're watching this, we're both transfixed, but we're watching this, really, it's really exciting. And he and McLuhan says in his erudite way of speaking that the Beatles took the audience at Shea Stadium, 55,000 kids, and they put it on like a mask, he said. And I turned to my dad and I said, what does he mean? And he said, I'm not really sure, but it's very intuitive. <laughs> and now out, I, course, I get it a little bit, a little bit better. I get it. Yeah. If, it, it turns out, of course, that the audience was screaming and you get 50,000 people screaming and the Beatles could not hear their own amplifiers. Yes. Yeah. They were playing like blind and deaf people, basically. Exactly. Exactly. But who needs to hear when you play the song, you know, 4,000 times. <laughs> so, so what, what did he really mean by that? Uh, what he meant was uh, that uh, artistic work, um, and another key phrase, in this, this case, he borrowed it from Ezra Pound. Uh, this is the artist, uh, is the antenna of the race. Um, what that means 
is that the artist is, I guess, in, in somewhat more uh, modern uh, or vernacular terms, um, he is channeling the audience's subconscious. Mm -hmm. So to get that sort of a reaction, the screams were not coming from any rational place in, in, <laughs> in, in that audience. Except estrogen, but that's not rational. <laughs> no, that's not. You, know, you could have taken a surfboard and surfed on the estrogen to Chase Stadium that night. Uh, yes, I, I imagine that there was a, uh, a, a great deal of uh, post-pubescent uh, estrogen. And so uh, you could have probably uh, populated half of Staten Island if you uh, had that <laughs> as your goal. They were ovulating left and right, borrowing that line from Saturday Night Live. All over. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the line from, um, there's the line from The Who, I think, in, uh, in, in the song 515, where the, um, the th people in the theater are spraying down the seats with eau de cologne. <laughs> okay yeah it's in the song 515 and it's from the girls peeing on the seats of course of course we don't have that now we don't, we don't have... uh no we now we've got diapers um <laughs> <laughs> so when i said where are we what i meant is where are we in this in the environment now we're meeting in this you know, are, are you really a bunch of pixels 740 by 300 on my screen? Or are, are you in New York? Are we, are, are we in two places at once? Where, where are we? Well, as the Fire Sign Theater uh, told us, you cannot be in two places at once if you're not any place at all. The virtuality of what we are doing is certainly artificial. Uh, and yet, um, I've made friends, you've made friends, a lot of people have made real friends. It doesn't become real until you um, are physically together. So we're, we're making good use of, of this suspended somewhere between imagination and memory. That is the location of where we uh, currently reside. This is a discussion of the inner senses, which is not a topic that Marsha McLuhan uh, had mastered. Um, in fact, uh, we uh, have written um, a 200 plus page uh, online book about this topic. So you will find at digital center dot, I'm sorry, digital life, oh, digital life, one we'll word. Link, we'll link directly to it. Yeah, okay. And you'll find uh, there um, Dianueticon, which is the journal. Uh, of the Center for the Study of Digital Life, and, and you will find ecology of the inner senses there. Mm -hmm. That is effectively the only place anywhere on the web, in a library, wherever, that you can find such a detailed discussion, including both some new essays and some older essays that had written about this in various dispersed places. But the simple way to summarize this is that for roughly 2,000 years, uh, starting with Aristotle, continuing all the way through uh, the classics, continuing through first and second millennia, literally until the late 19th to early 20th century, psychology, which is the study of the soul, psyche is Greek for soul, psychedelic means soul manifesting not mind manifesting. So I don't know if it was Humphrey Osmond who mistranslated that, but that's incorrect. It's soul manifesting. We have had a philosophical understanding of the soul as the form of a human being from Aristotle's hylozoism, matter and form. We've had that understanding in many variations for roughly 2,000 years. And then it was discarded rudely, abruptly, aggressively, and in a, in a highly biased fashion around uh, the turn of the 20th century. And, and so psychology as we understand it, particularly today's um, version, cognitive psychology, which is a behaviorist approach, completely eliminates the soul. That is the cause 
of this maelstrom. That is the reason why we're in so much turmoil. I agree that it's a spiritual crisis above and beyond and beneath and around every other, every, every, I mean, I say this every week in my column that the, we are in a spiritual crisis. When I, when I say digital, the effects of full digital conditions, I mean a spiritual crisis, the most important one. You're taking this back now to the age of the telephone and the electric light. Uh, we are in a new paradigm and it's the paradigm shift from television to digital that formally causes this crisis. The meaning crisis we're in is not something that humans do all the time. It's not the way we would like to live. Uh, it's, it's not ideal, but it is formally caused by changes in the technological medium. This is Marshall McLuhan's primary point. And as you know, to be fair, it is the principal point that McLuhan scholars try to ignore if they can. Yeah, I, I try not to. I, I understand the concept of formal cause, and it's I've I've had I've discussed it enough times to know how hard it is to get another person who someone who knows what it is to agree with me. But I really think that it's what he's talking about is things coming from the ground, that the that the that the ground is where the action is, not the dancing skeleton on the stage. Well, I think McLuhan would probably say at this point in the conversation, the action is in the gap between mm. the ground uh, and the figure, but whatever that might mean, I'm, I'm probably getting that wrong, but nonetheless, um, McLuhan failing to get faculty psychology which is the philosophical basis that I just described. Western psychology, by the way, there is no word for psychology in Japanese or Chinese. So we're dealing with, with radically different civilizations that they don't even have a word. Therefore, they have no word for psychology, but, as, which is the study of the soul. But, but as it turns out in the West, and Marshall McLuhan was a, very much a Westerner as are you and I, the, the absence of faculty psychology when Marshall McLuhan converted to the Catholic Church in 1925, there was no faculty psychology being discussed then. Mm -hmm. One of his closest friends, um, Jesuit priest uh, Walter Ong, knew all about this stuff but rejected it and therefore did not inform McLuhan. And so McLuhan had to find some psychological framework with which to discuss these changes in the soul. And he wound up with the um, effectively the anti-psychoanalytic school of Gestalt. So I'm, I'm sure you've run into this many times with, with other folks that you've talked with. Gestalt deliberately set itself apart from Freud and Jung, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that McLuhan adopted at least some phraseology from. Mm -hmm. he, did, he did not pursue it in any great detail. He did not obviously practice um, any sort of uh, psychological uh, or clinical practices. But in his language, he adopted figure and ground, which comes from Gestalt, mm -hmm. because he did not have faculty psychology, which is what we have added to McLuhan. Okay, so McLuhan talks a lot about the, the balance of the outer senses being shifted by different media. So reading the printed word uh, emphasizes a visual experience. And from what I have read, this really pushes subject and object as a kind of a new thing. And it, it changes how we perceive everything and, our, and particularly how we perceive ourselves to be looking at these meaningless glyphs on the page and translating them into entire universes changed the changed human consciousness irrevocably or at least uh, at, at, a as a stage matter, as yes. a speaking as a stage of development yes and, and as as a, a particular uh um detailed fact about this because i was involved with aspects of this um julian jane's origins of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind um a book that uh, i think you're familiar with um that book posited that the human self, the person, and its conscious capabilities 
uh, came about, and this is not actually in the book, I only know this because I was his last student, came about as a result of the alphabet. The alphabet obviously predates the printing press, but the printing press sort of, um, it, it drove, a, it, it attempted to drive a stake through the spiritual reality that preceded the printing press. And so the contest as exemplified in the Protestant Reformation, Remember, uh, Marshall McLuhan is raised a Protestant, mm -hmm. but he then um, rather dramatically um, at the age of 24 uh, converts to being Catholic. So these issues, their historic uh, trace, and most importantly, their relationship to technological paradigms um, was very much McLuhan's life's work. McLuhan died in 1980. He never um, worked on a computer. Um, as best I know, he didn't know how to type uh, or drive a car. Um, his sensibility was not a modern one. Um, he had a medieval sense. Type or drive a car? An author? Correct. He was written on yellow pads like a yes. lot of other authors? Yes. <laughs> and then his secretary typed it? Uh, his secretary typed it, or I believe uh, his wife actually did Grin. a lot of typing for him. Grin. But the 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 net of this is we must replace the careful work done by Marshall McLuhan um, with an updated version in which the balance is not amongst the exterior senses, but among the interior senses. Yep. Well, I've, I've got it. So... When you read, those of you who were inspired to read McLuhan by hearing these conversations and my endless uh, referencing of, uh, of, of the guy, uh, the, the shifting of the outer senses, for example, involves radio being an acoustically focused sense, which is brand new as a mass me. It's the first mass medium, really. So for thousands of years, people know thousands, I don't know, half a millennium, I don't know, whatever. Print the Gutenberg presses is in what, like uh, 13, 1400 or something? 1450s. 1450s. So as the book and the Bible, books and the Bible, predominantly the Bible, become prevalent, where we have an extreme emphasis on visual right. and subject object. Then right. and, one day and, and there's radio. And, and, uh, and individual uh, personal decision making, yes. Individual personal decision making as a result of deep reading or reading it at all? Re reading at all, doesn't matter how deep it is, but it is it is the primary uh, formal effect uh, of the printing press, which greatly amplifies the alphabetic impact of the earlier paradigm, which we call scribal. Right, and um, before we go to radio, I'm curious about the, the individual decision-making process of of of, of sure. book literacy this is fascinating so I, I'll, I'll give you a couple of of um references here um this is very much tied up with our use of the word freedom mm -hmm. and liberty mm -hmm. and it enters into a whole series of domains whether it actually originated in philosophy or not, probably doesn't matter for this conversation, but it did wind up being codified. So the print sensibility of individual freedom, which is utterly unique in human history. Mm -hmm. There is no comprehension in Chinese civilization, in Indian civilization, in scribal Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And increasingly it is being called into question now. Yep. So I will, without naming names, um, had a fascinating conversation this morning with a dear old friend of mine who for many years was a flaming libertarian, um, starting with Ayn Rand and then moving through all the rest of this stuff. And there are still some people like that around, but he is not. He, he is no longer uh, in that camp that extreme individual freedom, which is actually a negative freedom. It is freedom from mm -hmm. intrusion. 
That is not the way the human race has ever understood freedom before. Freedom instead has a, in addition to the negative um, valence, it has a positive vector. Not freedom from, but freedom mm -hmm. to. In particular, freedom to become a human. Mm -hmm. To be fair. You mean to self-actualize in some way? But, well, yes, but but the uh, the ultimate goal of that is not self-actualization. Soul actualization. Correct. <clears throat> and, the, and the soul, as you know, uh, from Genesis in what is still basically a, a Christian um, uh, civilization in the West, uh, based upon sacred texts of the Bible, Genesis, very beginning, is where it is proposed that we are made in the image and likeness of God. So we're made in the image and likeness. We are not gods, mm -hmm. but we continually strive to transcend ourselves. And that, I think, is a, is a critical piece of what it means to be human. That was largely uh, pushed aside when what we would probably generally call science took over from philosophy and the product of that science taking over from philosophy, in other words, reducing the human soul to a series of incentives and behaviors. Skinner box life. If you reduce the soul to a Skinner box, you will wind up with the very screwed up world we live in today. Yeah, it's making perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what does radio do to the literate society? Um, McLuhan described it as uh, exchanging an eye for an ear. <laughs> um, I remember that. Yeah. The the, uh, the point here was, uh, and this is a very important um, additional element here. When I speak of paradigms, I do not in any way imply that there is instantaneous overnight change. I do, mm -hmm. do not want to imply that everybody grasps this at the same time. It's a much more elaborate and complicated situation, but probably the most important thing that um, McLuhan offered on this, which is difficult for most to understand, is that in making that transition from one medium to another, the older medium becomes the figure, becomes the content. The new medium becomes the ground, again, to use the Gestalt technology, um, mm -hmm. uh, psychology terms. So what does radio do? Radio gives us a uh, great Gatsby. Ra radio gives us a, a whole bunch of print stuff, and um, but it doesn't matter so much anymore. You're saying that under the influence of radio, writing changed. Absolutely. Okay, why why do you use the Great Gatsby? Well, what what's um what's the salient thing about that book that makes it a radio work of radio? Well, um, backing up here a second, in in the way that that we describe these things, there have been five major media driven, formerly caused paradigms in Western history. Mm -hmm. Those would be the oral. Before writing. Mm -hmm. Then scribal. The scribal, which is the beginning of, of writing. Scribal then becomes intensified with print. Yep. And then print winds up uh, disappointing. Print winds up um, not being uh, satisfactory. Um, you wind up with uh, arguments and disputes and, and uh, it's all over the place. And so print had to be replaced and it was replaced by the electric. Radio is not the first, but it's one of the most important um, electric paradigm mediums. Most people would say that telegraph was the origin of this and, and telegraph has got about 50 years on uh, It on does, radio. but it's not a mass medium. That's the difference. It's what's, it's a private, well, let, what's let me, person let me, to person. Let me suggest the following. And I, I'm not disagreeing because I don't argue, but <laughs> but I would only suggest for you that newspapers 
our mass medium, and they never would have worked as such without Telegraph. Telegraph and the news wire services fed the newspapers as a mass medium. Okay, so they, the definition of a mass medium is everyone listening at the same time or, or synchronous. So in other words, when, we, when I put this broadcast, podcast, whatever we're talking, calling it cast, whatever, yeah, onto yeah. the internet, and people are listening at different times around the clock and maybe in 25 years, that's not a mass medium. But when everyone is waiting for the morning paper and then they're waiting for the evening paper and the paper boy shouts out that extra, extra, read all about it, four star edition, that does qualify as a mass medium. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I get it. And the speed of, of communication, the transmission of photos and articles um, makes the papers what they are and it informs the writing style. The writing style of reverse pyra inverted pyramid is based on whether the transmission is going to get cut off midway and therefore you pack the top instead of leading up to your conclusion. This is a- or, Yes, or, or as a New York Times reporter, a friend of mine once told me, you know your article is going to be edited. So what you do is you make sure that you don't bury the lead so the leads at the top, and you make sure that the conclusion is a powerful one, and you actually don't care about all the paragraphs in between. <laughs> and you hope the editor doesn't read to the end, yeah. and they just say, "Oh, it's a good lead," and they don't read to the end. They just change a few things and uh, and push send. If you've ever done typesetting, and I have, for newspapers, <clears throat> and uh, the way that it works is you wind up with uh, exactly this many column inches. Yes. In order to fit it into the physical format of a newspaper, if you've got an 11-inch article and it's got to fit in a 10-inch um, column, uh, an inch worth of stuff's going to go on the floor. Right. They don't shrink the typeface. They don't shrink the point size or compact no. the letting to like, you know, point size 12 on nine, smash it all the way in. Uh, they, they, cut, they, cut, they cut some stuff out. Yes, but, but you, you've made a very uh, key point here. In, in fact, there are uh, highly skilled designers who have chosen uh, point size and font and, and may from time to time change it uh, as they think they need to modernize uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing. But in many ways, that's what the newspaper is that design and writers are going to have to conform to it and readers more importantly um, uh, also uh, find themselves conforming uh, to these design decisions so but it almost sounds as if the if we're talking about um, the old technology of say for example telegraph driving the new technology of the newspaper it almost sounds like telegraph is actually the ground and the formal cause of this manifestation that we're reading, which doesn't seem very electronic. I've even got newspapers here. I, I like to collect the old ones. And anytime I can, I put something on newsprint, but you don't, you're not thinking it's an electronic thing. It's paper. You can light the fireplace right. with it. Right. You're not going to get a shock from it. At least not an yes, electric exactly. shock. Exactly. But if we're counting telegraph from, and therefore the beginning of the electric paradigm to the uh, mid 1800s, the newspaper doesn't, even itself really catch on until you wind up with things like the New York Times and wind up with, with various promoters and, and ultimately James Joyce uh, reading News of the World. So it's the late 19th, early 20th century before newspapers um, really become a big deal, by which time everybody is quite familiar with Western Union. How are people getting information before newspapers? Because there's, no, there's, no other, there's nothing else. They're just spreading rumors around? <laughs> Making up stories? Um, I mean, how? We, we'll, we'll return to the question of information uh, in a minute, which is a word that I'm very happy uh, to remove from our vocabulary mm. because it, it is a fake word. But the answer to your question is that they wind up with all sorts of locally published uh, materials. Uh, printing presses uh, uh, on a local basis were around for a very long time and so there were broadsides and, and there were leaflets and the, the, the French Revolution could not have happened without the printing press. Everybody was printing. Th though there were pockets, rural po pockets where there were no newspapers. Sure. 
Okay. I know this from uh, investigating 1912 crime, uh, and 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 where you know it's a serial crime, wh where and where not these were reported, and like the further toward Florida you get, ba basically in this story, around the turn of the century, 20th century, the less newspapers there are, people couldn't even read and write down there. Right. So that's a long time and, to and, wait and, for. And, unless they wanted to vote. As, as you recall, one of the components of Jim Crow is that you had to be literate to vote in some, in some sense. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. And that's not because that's not in the Constitution anywhere. <laughs> Doesn't say that. My, my, my personal opinion would be that America ceased to be a constitutional republic in the Civil War. But, uh, but be that as it may. I, I'm curious about that. And the Civil War I have read in McLuhan and pondered greatly was an effect of telegraph. Yes. Uh, There's always Lincoln, a war but, to accompany the new medium. Correct. Lincoln was the first telegraph president, correct? Yeah. I mean, he personally went to the telegraph room in the White House and sent famous telegrams. I mean, yeah. imagine the telegraph operator, the president of the United States sitting there with him, uh, trying to get the words right. Yeah. Amazing. So... So let's just focus this point. So the newspaper industry, newspaper phenomenon is being driven invisibly by all this electronic transmission. Right. And it's, in a sense, it is the internet, only all we're getting is the printed form of it. And it is the people on the inside who are seeing the teletype and, you know, seeing the teletype, translating the electronic communications and retyping them into a kind of a quickly made book format. Yes, and, and it would also be fair because we none of these things are black and white, which is why it's not such a good idea to argue when you um, might rather understand. But telegraph wouldn't have happened without the railroads. Because and they needed telegraph to run the railroad safely? Yes, and they needed the, the railroads to in order to run the telegraph lines. Okay, so you, yeah. they, no, no, no one went out and strung telegraph in, in the larger uh, country, went out and ran telegraph lines by digging holes and sticking in poles. They were all doing it on railroad right away. Aha. Uh -huh. This is really interesting. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've read and I even acquired a copy of the book, The Road, that, that roads are made as a result of the need to carry the mail. So the mail, the running people running around with little scrolls needed roads to travel on. And when the papyrus ran out, the roads went into disrepair. Right. This, this is of uh, uh, Hilaire Belloc's The Road? Yeah, I've got it on my McLuhan shelf, but yes. Uh, yeah, th no, that, it, belo it belongs there. It, it absolutely belongs there. And I have asked the question of many McLuhan scholars because I've confirmed with Eric McLuhan that Marshall had read everything that Belloc had written. I have been asking around and nobody even understands the question, to what extent was the road the actual impetus for much of what McLuhan was doing? I mean, I, I read something yesterday that again repeated that it was all Harold Innes. No way. McLuhan was working on these things in the 30s and 40s when he was um, linked when he was particularly at Cambridge, when he was linked to Belloc. Another work by Belloc, Crisis and Civilization, might be worth retrieving. It is a series of lectures delivered by Hilaire Belloc at Fordham University in New York, in the Bronx. And it was rushed to print in 1937. I have long wondered, I know that McLuhan read it because Eric told me, but that Marshall, his father had read it, but um, I've been completely unsuccessful in trying to get the McLuhan scholars uh, to, to wrestle with these sorts of questions. Belloc is a uh, persona non grata in so many areas that when um, uh, a close friend of mine, Peter Berkman, uh, wanted uh, to find somebody, he, he Googled all over the place, who would put McLuhan and Belloc in the same sentence even, the only person he could find was me. <laughs> and then we became great friends. I'm surprised this is not a topic of, of, of fascination. I mean, and, and uh, of kind of ever deepening inquiry. I mean, 
uh, these are fabulous questions. They're what I love the most about when I read Understanding Media is all, all of these layers of interrelation uh, between things are the essence. You taught, you began by saying the space between, and I mean that we're really in the space between when we're talking about the roads going into disrepair when the papyrus runs out. Right. This is mind blowing, and it may. It, and I never, uh, I never thought the same of, of roads called Albany post, post Road. There's a lot of post roads everywhere now. You know what they mean by post roads? They were postal roads uh, for the for the mail to be delivered. This is this is now plainly obvious. People, there's no Albany Post Road in New York City. If you're a, or where where all the developers are naming these streets after there, their daughters, there, there, right? There, there is in the Bronx. There is ah. Okay, but the Bronx is in the country. The, the, that's, you know, anything north of the Agreed. Dakota building is in the Dakotas. Agreed. Agreed. So um, it's in the boonies. Um, okay, so we've got, we have different media driving each other. And we talk, now we've given this wonderful example of, 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 of scrolls driving the development of roads and probably advances in the chariot and harnesses and all this shit. But now we, and we're moving to the modern times, we have tech, technological things like the telegraph defining what a newspaper is the tone of the writing what gets illustrated uh this is amazing uh to have to ha have these uh these these interrelations so i had not quite thought i mean i've gone down the road of uh of telegraph driving newspapers but not this succinctly Well, and and we can keep on going and start talking about horses and and uh, and how how all of these things uh, came together. But that uh, avoids because this winds up just being a history of technology, and and mm. one one thing uh, leads to another. It avoids the spiritual question. It it avoids the psychological question. Psychological the question is, is the soul. Yes. So, a part of the reason I believe why McLuhan has been um, avoided. You you have a very good reason uh, for your father uh, for pursuing interest in, in McLuhan. You might have done it on your own. Um, I have no buddy I can claim other than the fact that I was a curious kid in the 60s and McLuhan was a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I'm old enough to have been a part of sort of the, the original explosion of McLuhan. But I can tell you that there was something about reading Understanding Media, published first in 1964, and then uh, the medium is the massage uh, in 67. And I read these books more or less when they first came out. Mm -hmm. And there was something about it that struck me as pro so profound that I would have to try to better understand it and even try to apply it. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that in my case uh, to having a very strange childhood mm -hmm. in particular. Um, I didn't watch television. Well, a lot of people didn't watch television. Um, I did listen to radio, but not enormously. May I ask what year you were born? 48. I'm 75 years old. 48. So you're 58. You're coming of age as a teenager in the age when television is starting to show up in homes. Correct. Um, and so for me, television meant Ed Sullivan mm. and Howdy Doody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, interesting. Pu a, a puppet and, and uh, Topo Gigio was a famous character on oh, Ed yeah. Sullivan, made the most appearances. Puppets work very, very well on television. Let's not, as does cartooning, but let's not quite go there yet. So we're, we're, we've got that, uh, that radio is pushing print now we're talking about the great gatsby so the great gatsby is a print publication book of the radio era correct so what is radio i, I happen to love that book but what is and i happen to love radio what is radio about the great great gatsby it seems so visual the book is so beautifully visual right, right. well here's where i would begin to enter into the conversation of the balancing of the inner senses mm. Yes. Um, because obviously, Great Gatsby is fantasy. No one ever proposed that this was a factual account. This is not a history book. It's a fantasy book. You mean a work of fiction? That's fine. Work of what, fiction. No. 
Is, but, is all fiction but, fantasy? But, is all fiction fantasy? I think what we have come to understand as fiction. Now, let's let's remember here. Um, there's an enormous amount of material that was written in the Renaissance, written in the Middle Ages, where we would have a hard time exactly distinguishing fact from fiction. Mm. So there's a plague in Florence. A bunch of people leave uh, town, go up into the hills. And as a result of that, we get the Decameron. Is it Boccaccio's Decameron? Is that a work of fiction? Or is that a, wor a work of of uh, history, a work of, of facts? Yeah, um, I mean, the, I the write, names I, have been changed to protect the innocent, but what's being described is what actually happened. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of ways to consider this. I mean, everything is a product of its moment, right? Yeah. Everything, you know, everything written is somehow infused with the moment in which it's written and the times in which it's created, well, no matter what it purports to be, right? And the more successful it is, the more it is of the moment, because that means the audience is prepared for it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I write horoscopes and I've been asked a lot of times, you know, are these things real or do you just make them up? And the, the answer I give is all writing is made up. <laughs> not doing anything differently. Well, um, the difference between the inner sense of imagination and the inner sense of memory. Mm-hmm is at the very heart of everything we're talking about. So if we're going to update McLuhan, we're going to take into account everything you said about the balancing of the external senses. Yep. We now will have to come to grips with the balance of the inner senses. So can we define some of the inner senses? I, I keep a yes. running list in my, in my notebook from the night that we talked. So let's say memory, Imagination. Well, let, let me let me uh, give you the exact reference here, so your your listeners, if they care to, oh. they can go uh, uh, figure this out. Um, psychology was invented by Aristotle. His work, Peri Psyche in Greek, um, recognizing here that wise are sometimes translate uh, transliterated as used, but nonetheless. Our word, English word, psyche, is from the Greek word, psyche. And the study of that could not be done by Plato. Plato wasn't all that interested in what happens in real life. He was mostly interested in what happens in ideal life. Mm. So the forms, as delivered, uh, discovered and uh, greatly written about in Plato, they are not in the material world. The forms are external to all of that and they are perfect. They are unitary and they are perfect. Perhaps the biggest single difference, and there are many others as well as many basic agreements between Plato and his student Aristotle is the topic of forms. I remember when I was beginning to try to explain formal cause to an old friend and he said, oh, I get it. It's the uh, the, the circle and the good and, and all, all the rest of these things from Plato. I said, <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I, 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 while I believe you've had uh, a decent education, this may not be so obvious, but Plato fundamentally disagreed. So the, these forms are perceived and the first interior sense that they collide with and begin to be organized around. To this day, still the name of what we use to call common sense, mm -hmm. which is probably difficult to pin down in, in our times. I meditate on it daily. So we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> the common sense in, in Latin is census communis. Yes. And census communis is, um, as McLuhan correctly understood, um, unfortunately he didn't go the next step, but he correctly understood uh, census communis is where everything gets collated, where all of your external senses in whatever balance they may be, they all come together and we come to understand that we have sensory perceptions from multiple senses that all refer to the same uh, object. That's the common sense. 
when the common sense figures that out, so to speak, it doesn't just let it go. It doesn't just throw it uh, into the garbage. It has to store it someplace. All these images that are getting um, collated across the different uh, sensory modalities, the imagination in its original meaning meant the place where the images are stored. But very importantly, they have not become associated with each other or with time yet. So there needs to be another activity that goes beyond simply storing images, which are collated across the senses, something which then brings into association the images. And in particular, it brings them into association in a timeline. That That's is memory. And that, no, that is actually called the cogitative sense. The cogitative sense. Yes, not cognitive, but cogitative. And the book which I referred to earlier, The uh, Ecology of the Inner Senses, is, is what makes it different from thousands of other books, is that it brings together both our modern understanding and uh, a wide variety of other understandings uh, of the cogitative sense. It's focused on the cogitative sense, which is the one that is most forgotten. The cogitative sense is the one that, um, to use uh, McLuhan's uh, terminology, remember he talks about percepts, precepts, and concepts. The percepts have to do with the um, common sense and imagination. This is our whole Im imaginary world. It's, it's a world of images without yet meaning, without yet association. And then uh, the cogitative sense does takes it the next level and prepares it for uh, our intellect. Uh, so cogitative sense stores its associated timeline linked um, uh, process. I don't know why I use that word. Why did I use that word? Uh, um, uh, because we're not processors. <laughs> Human beings are not processors. So unfortunately, the word process has been taken out of my vocabulary. I'll use it anyway. Uh, the imagination is processed by the cogitative sense, and the results are stored in memory. Now, all of this can be found in one particular place and the commentary on that, if any of your um, viewers uh, are interested. And here we have to go to St. Thomas Aquinas, wrote a great deal on the subject, and in particular in his most encyclopedic work, Summa Theologica, um, in book one, question 78, article number four, the title of which is, um, are the interior senses properly distinguished? That's to say, that's the title in English translation. Uh, uh, Aquinas wrote in Latin. Um, but uh, that is, that, that is the, the ground of its broader conversation uh, about faculty psychology. Um, this now maps on to medium. So just as you had correctly indicated, and as McLuhan insisted, and as the Gutenberg Galaxy uh, details, while at the same time trying to not be a linear book, is the linearity of print. McLuhan's interest in the surround character of electric took us another step forward, but it doesn't get us to where we are today. What our subconscious mind uh, does um, as we're growing up is that we are compelled to have to figure out how are we going to fit in? How are we going to be a part of society? And the way that we learn how to do that, the way we train our sensibility is through the, the characteristics of the dominant medium at the time that we are 12 years old. The dominant medium at the time we're 12 years old is the thing that kind of forms us the most. It has to. 
They're, why, tw why 12? 12 is the line of puberty, more or less. Yeah, I'm just I'm just saying before puberty, because when, when puberty hits, everything goes wacky and, and you're no longer on that. that so case. those years up till age 12. Yes, and what we, we used to call it grammar school. And um, so, you know, age 8 to 12 or something like that. Th that is period that the um, developmental psychologist, um, uh, Piaget, Jean Piaget, identified as the concrete operational development stage. So we are, the whole Piaget story, we don't need to rehearse here, but he singles out that unique period as we're heading into puberty, but we've, we've mastered uh, language, we, we've mastered a lot of other skills, we've mastered uh, some capabilities, uh, we've learned how to write, we've learned how to read, uh, and so now, now we need to somehow pull all this together and figure out if we're going to be a serial killer or a uh, saint. <laughs> so most of us were impressed by television at this age. Yes. T, t, for most, most of us, most adults, and even, even a good few young people, uh, what, does that, uh, what, what does that say about us? That we're all directors and producers of our own TV show? Well, that's what social media is, of course. We're, 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 we're playing television on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is not a digital medium. It's an electric medium. Why isn't Facebook digital? Be because its format is advertising supported and everybody becomes a producer director. It is, it is just the next step. It is just the one-to-one -one step on television. It was invented, social media was actually invented in the 80s long before there was even an internet advertisers naturally said to each other well we've been through demographics we've been through psychographics we've been through all these various ways of trying to identify audiences what if we could actually profile people and target them directly it's a 1980s television advertising idea okay I, i'm not suggesting that mark zuckerberg knew about any of this he was going along in effect with the plan which was in place long before we came along. Right. So the concept is what matters, but the underlying ground is still zeros and ones. Uh, correct. And I think that's a very important part that I never can get anyone to talk to me about <laughs> because I learned from my McLuhan training that you really want to go to the most invisible level to find the underlying ground. Right. And, and, and where this is all a bunch of zeros and highly entertaining. People are learning true. things, but it's all right. zeros and ones going by. And, and why is it zeros and ones and not something more complicated? Well, it becomes pretty complicated pretty quickly. Yeah. But when, you know, the, the microprocessor the has like 35,000 different I'm separate like, little processors in there to. Uh, I'm with you. Open and the gate and close the gate. We can uh, talk the memory gates. And times so, uh, we can talk uh, logic gates and so forth. But the answer to the question of why it is ones and zeros is because that is the only way at that time to build memory chips. As opposed to what? What could we do now? More complicated uh, scripts? There's a, there, there's a huge revival now underway for analog computers, for instance. There's a very wide recognition that if you digitize things into ones and zeros, you're going to miss a whole lot of stuff. You're a music guy. You know all the discussions about an analog tape and analog discs and, and digital yep. recorders and so forth. Well, why do you think we went to digital recording? What was the purpose of doing that? The purpose? Yeah. Well, the purpose of the next medium always seems to be to sell the medium. That doesn't seem to be a... Um... Some well, kind of a uh, brotherly love a kind of a purpose here. It's just the next thing to sell, usually, right? Yes. Who, who but, needed but digital the, audio tape when, when you you know you had perfectly good cassettes? Right. Um, recognizing that neither DAT nor uh, cassettes were all that perfect, but nonetheless, um, the answer that people will give you is that um, you could increase the signal to noise ratio by going through an analog to digital, digital to analog conversion chain. I've spoken with many of the early pioneers. That is not what they were doing. They were very, very conscious that they were in, in recording terms. They were up against the limits of the memory of an analog tape. <clears throat> 
And and memory, so meaning like how many tracks it could hold? Yeah. P plain and simple. I mean, yeah, we, you, we, we, they had we, four, we, like the Beatles working on four tracks. There's not a lot of tracks left, especially if you've got to leave one empty to overdub. They were working four tracks on a half inch or one inch tape. We did ultimately get to Leon Russell's 48 tracks on a three inch tape. But, but that, that did not work very well. Um, and so we wound up with 32 and, and 48 track um, digital Sony recorders that pretty quickly replaced those multi-track machines. Okay. <laughs> and signal noise was, was not the issue because um, uh, in, in fact, it was the amount of storage was ultimately the issue, which did have a signal to noise component to it. Uh, and so we have now come around to the point that um, uh, 192 uh, uh, bit depth and, and 96 uh, kilohertz sampling rate, uh, nobody cares how much memory it takes. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting development. And, and in particular, uh, to make it much worse, as you know, video is, is far more memory consumptive. And it, it could very well be argued that um, digital recording was uh, being drawn in because of the recognition of the limits of analog videotape. It wasn't even an analog, uh, I mean, rather a, a audio matter, but more of a video matter. Mm -hmm. But ho however it was, we must recognize that the 12-year-old child winds up absorbing the, the ground structures the formal structures of the communications medium that they are using to try to figure out what they're going to do with their lives. And just as the McLuhan was correct about this, the, the linearity, the um, one thing right after another, uh, the uh, all of the particular characteristics of print, Gutenberg, Gutenberg Galaxy is filled with this sort of discussion. It was the actual um, technological, if you will, material physical properties of print that wound up being lodged in our subconscious. And therefore, uh, as the famous saying goes, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. So that was given by a priest and theologian, John Culkin, Culkin uh, in 1967 at Fordham, because he had managed to invite McLuhan. Culkin was not a technologist, Culkin was not an engineer, and Culkin was most importantly, not a psychologist. So the phrase, and then they, and therefore, thereafter they shape us, we shape our tools, thereafter they shape us. That actually makes no sense. Well, I didn't <laughs> shape television. Uh, I was just watching it. Yeah, sure. But I'll tell you something interesting. <laughs> the context in which I first remember television was my father was working on his PhD and we would watch the news every night in the 60s and he had a microphone taped onto the speaker when the speaker was on the side of the TV. Remember those TV sets? Yeah, sure, sure. And he was, we had to be very quiet because he wanted to get a recording of the content of the news. He must've been taking some class. And so I, I don't remember a TV. I remember a TV with a microphone taped onto the side with masking tape okay. for the purpose of future analysis and i think this shaped me profoundly the mere act of my dad connecting the microphone to the television set not because we were going to consume it not because daddy was going to consume it and eat more potato chips while watching the game but rather because there was something here that needed to be thought about and whatever which, professor which, made him right. do that i'm eternally grateful to because which, it which, taught which me the end, it's changing television into a radio news program but I think more, more so than that, I never heard the tapes, but what was to, to me, the message implicit was we, this is something that we are going to think about in the future. We're not just sucking it up our nose like cocaine. We, we are, which is what most people do with television. This is a, this is going to be the subject of future thought and analysis. Would you agree that that's part of the message of daddy yes, and, taping and, the mic to yes, the TV and, and, so and we must this, shut up and pay attention to not ruin the 
of course, I'm sure he wishes he had our voices, right? Now that, you know, now, now, it's, now it's 50 years later, it would have been nice to have recordings of the family, and he doesn't have those tapes. This is a person who has a receipt for everything he ever bought and the thing itself, like his 57 Gibson guitar. He still got the receipt, but he doesn't have those tapes. I'm deeply so disappointed. This, so this is radio as the content of television. But there were no video recorders at that time. He would have been doing that on a Betamax if they existed. But all that you could bring in your home was a tape recorder at that point. Yes, but, but the sensibility of your father to even want to do that is a radio sensibility, which is how you describe yourself. But when does radio... Ah, ah. So this, this, this partly accounts for my kind of... I'm not sure the word I'm looking for, but retro retro approach to things yes of course look at look at the name of your website planet waves you, you radios are waves television is not a wave broadcast radios tv waves. isn't broadcast tv is not waves well it was once upon a time it is no more but but the but the point is people didn't think of it uh in the same way yes they would put an antenna on the roof yeah but but the whole notion of quantum mechanics and particles and waves and so forth. That's all radio era stuff. To emphasize, ah. the, to emphasize the waves part of this, is, it's not incorrect, but it, it just has a particular timestamp. So TV is kind of like an elaboration of radio waves. Yes. TV waves are not, there's no TV waves. There's only, it's only radio waves. I'd have to be carrying a video band, video kind of component. I, I don't believe that people thought the same way about waves under radio and television conditions, but I could be wrong. But I'm just making a, a leap in association. And I don't know what Bob Dylan had in mind when he renamed his album Planet Waves, but the album was, uh, I know the producer of that album, Rob Ferboni, and I can tell you a funny I, story. I, I know Rob also, unfortunately, and, and I knew his recently deceased wife. Yes, a lovely person. Um, he made me dinner a couple of months ago, uh, right around the time we met in November. Um, and, uh, and, and he said the, the album was originally called Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and that something like uh, 200,000 copies were printed, and Bob had them shredded and renamed the album Planet Waves. Right. And I'm not sure what he was thinking, but I love the idea, and it's the particle versus wave. My approach is very much that, uh, that the planets are waveforms or fields rather than particles floating around right uh and i it, i think it may be a reference to ginsburg's planet news he had a poem in the 60s called well, planet, it, it, planet it's news quite possible but as you know very well there is nobody named bob dylan well there's a guy who calls himself bob dylan that's a different thing but furthermore the guy who calls himself bob dylan who was born uh, robert zimmerman yes uh converted from judaism to born again christianity Okay. And made that a very salient point at various points in his career. Well, particularly 78, 77, you know, that era, that era when he did that. Um, yeah. And, so what? And, and figured out that the audience didn't want that. So he became a fake again. When, when Johnny Mitchell says that's not his voice, that's a fake voice. Well, of course it's a fake voice. <laughs> but, it, but it was a fake it's no but 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 it's no more fake than whether i choose to use a pen or, or a pencil or a colored pencil uh it, it, he was he was using a rough nib to to communicate so as not to be pretty he was trying to eliminate the prettiness of singing and to give you something you were going to pay attention to that might grate on your skin a little bit rather than being seduced by like elvis presley crooning <laughs> that's my take on the message of the medium of Bob's put on voice to put on. It is put you would on. agree with that. Absolutely. Like the whole Bob Dylan that we have come to know, and in many cases for good reasons, because we're an audience that, that it is being drawn in by this. And so it's our subconscious that is being uh, seduced, but it, but it is for me a great example of how television is inherently an illusion box, deliberately designed to produce nothing but illusions. And Bob Dylan recognized this and recognized that his audience was a television audience, not a radio audience. And the television audience wants to be fooled. 
and Bob provided him uh, with platter after platter of illusion. I, 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 I find it fascinating. Is, is this to um, is this to um, discount the the power and doc documentary relevance of the word the songs he wrote? I think of him as a novelist, really. When I think of Dylan, a song like Chimes of Freedom, to me, this is just a magnificent short novel. The, the net of this is that the entire television era is an imaginary era. It appeals to the uh, common sense and the imaginary uh, uh, imagination that is associated with it, but it never resolves things into meaningful associations and, uh, and time relationships. It is very deliberately a illusion. As you know, we've discussed this. Simple experiment. Anybody who has a camera, digital cameras is fine. Set the shutter speed to 200 frames per second or 400, uh, 400 of a second, and point it at any raster scan. Doesn't have to be television, it can be a computer, any raster scan, and you will. Hit the button. Reveal. Nothing. Nothing appears. There's no because appears. you're shooting faster than the than the refresh rate. And so, what 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 makes you catch the the blank spot rather than catching one uh, one one moment it where it's a blank spot? Um, there the, the, there there will be a a, a raster scan beam which is uh, walking its way back and forth the screen, but you will not be able to see it. It'll just look like a big black blob. So our psyche has been compelled under radio conditions to somehow construct a image when there's no image there. There's no motion, there's no color, there's no image. It's all an illusion. However, it is a kind of an, an externalization of the imagination. Yes, but it can never get you to the ground. It can never get you to the truth. It can never get you to God. It can never get you to anything with meaning because it is all deliberately surrounded with a culture that is trying to constantly convince you, not only do you need this, but we're going to help you figure out what, what this is all about, this illusion is all about. Um, digital is not about imagination. Digital is about remembering, because that's what a computer does. Now, the reason why I can be so um, bold in these statements is because once upon a time, I was a professional computer architect. And I know in some degree of detail, what everybody who goes out to buy an iPhone knows as well. The only decision you have to make is how much memory. But I know from what goes on inside these machines, they spend almost no time computing. They spend a lot of time shuttling things around, most of which is internal to memory. So they're trying to go out and get something from memory, bring it into the processor, compute, send it back to memory. And if the stuff is not where it's supposed to be the whole thing shuts down yeah yeah those and are most crashes right the b tree whatever it's called the directory crashes the yeah. stuff's on the drive the map is what crashes that's correct and uh and or the index um as yeah. the case might be but th this is a fundamentally different technology television remembers nothing no, they weren't even recording when when uh, when the when Kennedy was uh, reported to have been murdered. They start recording like 15 minutes into the incident. Correct. At like 12:45 or something, the, that first uh, thing by who uh, by Cronkite is uh, not uh, that's those are all the second reports that were uh, that were. That's reported. correct. And the Bruder film, which is another illusion, film obviously, shutters on on, on a film. Um, many. Uh, stories about manipulation of that medium also. Uh, so uh, we have been living in a illusory world at so many levels, it comes as a massive shock that organizing a, something that is make-believe uh, while entertaining, while uh, 
pleasurable um, while uh, even useful. Um, it has become more and more clear to people that there's something wrong with living in a make-believe world, particularly once the make-believe begins to violate what you think are the most important things in the world. So the election of Trump was, was the breakthrough. That was the breakthrough when the uh, narrative that supports the illusions um, came undone. And so we're now in a situation as exemplified by the firing of, of Tucker Carlson and, and him going from television to Twitter. <laughs> we're, we're now in a situation where it, you, you kind of can't ignore the fact that there's a whole lot of people out there making things up and I don't really want to live that way. So from the beginning of television until now, it has literally only been recently that the trust in the media has declined to such an extent that the recognition that um, many people in power are lying to you and television is the primary means by which they do that. This is a relatively new phenomenon. My assertion, suggestion, is that that would never have happened without the movement from television to the digital sphere. We are, we're, we're, now uh, in, we're now in a radically different um, paradigm, which therefore looks to us, since we're holding on, as we always do, um, to the past paradigm, we're, we're in a, a maelstrom. The descent in the maelstrom is now, my answer to your first question. Okay, I think I've, I think this is a revolutionary moment um, that the translation of TV into digital because of the exactness of memory and the ability to retrieve, which didn't exist in television, except if you happen to catch a rerun, reveal the illusion of, of TV for what it was because we could keep watching it over and over again. Well, I, I would actually- um, Or analyze it, transcribe it. Yeah, None of this existed in the TV age. There was no, my dad was going for that effect to be able to transcribe the TV program, but right. he somehow was way ahead of his time studying at Postman, at, uh, near Postman at NYU, specifically to learn this shit. Right. But it reveals something about the TV medium when you recontextualize it in a thing that remembers everything. Right. So we're now in a political situation where literally anything that you ever said on TV can be dredged up again, will, will be used against, will be. <laughs> and people forget this. This is the hilarious thing that the cops wearing a camera this big on their, on their thing, somehow forget that they're, that they're, they're personally a TV crew, right? There's no gaffer and key grip running around behind them. And then they're doing all this stuff on television and they are oblivious to the fact that it is all on television. I've been told that there are substantially more um, surveillance cameras, TV cameras in London than there are in uh, Shanghai. I'm not surprised at all. London, the, the, Brits are, the, the Brits are just completely perverse. That <laughs> I've been there. I wrote horoscopes in those newspapers. It was fun. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, yeah, sure to go down to the news agent at uh, five o'clock in the morning and I'm right in the Daily Mail. I mean, that's great. That I, it, may, it may not be walking out on the stage at a Grateful Dead concert like Suzanne Vega playing a few songs, but for horoscope writers, it's the, <laughs> it's the equivalent and very few ever get to experience that, that thrill. I'm not for a moment suggesting that we should stop imagining. That would be terrible. No, I think to the contrary. You, you, you're, you're, you want... If you, if you re balance the relationship between memory and imagination, they both suddenly become much stronger. The problem with being presented with nothing but illusions all day long and, and therefore becoming depressed, I mean, the, the we have a dominant psychological uh, behaviorist strain called cognitive psychology. On any measure, it has totally failed. Has yep. anybody come back around and said, we're, we're, we're hearing this now from the Surgeon General, social media 
is bad for kids. <clears throat> you know, from the history of all of this, nobody dared to say that about television. No. The one man who wrote a book, uh, Four Reasons for the Elimination of Television, turns out to have been working uh, through Howard Gossage, uh, the advertising executive, uh, and he recently died, Jerry um, Mander, uh, recently died. He was trying to put McLuhan's, and remember, McLuhan is not going to tell anybody what to do. He's, no, he's, not, judging, he's not judging things. He's just he's pointing out exactly what they are, which a lot of people find incredibly frustrating that he won't just come out and say that it's bad. <laughs> Jerry Mander came out and said it was bad. Yeah. And now who remembers that book except you and me? A couple of people. Yeah, but, but the people who read his, his obit uh, a couple of weeks ago and paid attention to it. Oh, he just died? Yes. Ah. Which, which is what refreshed my memory about it. And, and it was in that, in reading those obits, that, that I, I learned um, how closely he was trying to, to accomplish what McLuhan wouldn't do. That book was exactly as you described it. People were pissed at McLuhan for not taking sides. And so he had to take a side. Mander had to take a side. Mander did. But, but look, isn't it, isn't it enough but, that McLuhan- Precisely, yeah. And, and, and it, of course, made no difference. Advertising. It made no difference. You, no, you, it made no you, difference. You, you, you know the history of, of the legislative attempts um, around the topic of truth in advertising? Uh, there, let's there were, see. There were How very, can you tell the truth? Well, Look, I mean, I, I know enough about the ad industry to know that the whole thing is a lie. The whole, the whole concept is a lie. Do you consider Don Draper? I, I mean, I consider Don Draper to be a heroic character in the history of, of this all. When he makes that speech, he says, you don't want to give your girlfriend a diamond ring to, to get married. I told you you want to give your girlfriend a, <laughs> a diamond ring. And that's one of the few cohesive analyses of content yeah. that, that there is. We, 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 want, we go to the part of the frustration of the McLuhan work is let's okay but we need I really do want to understand the content component of this not as the dominant thing that everyone else is you know oh South Park they have potty mouth and all this shit but <laughs> I have to curse in the sentence of course um, but but to understand that there that it does somehow play a role and that the the medium the, the message of the medium becomes a vector for different types of deception and different types of art. It, it facilitates certain things, but each one works a little bit better than others or worse than others in some ways. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. And I would further suggest that somebody's gonna step forward and uh, try to bring charges against senior advertising executives for crimes against humanity. Well, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? I mean, they, the, the, uh, these ads are so incredibly deceptive. It, it's just one, I, I couldn't, the the pharmaceutical ads were alone were were killing me, and I, I wanted to introduce legislation banning guitars in ad, in in pharmaceutical ads. There's always a guy strumming the fucking guitar in the in the drug ad, and it's like, and he's always about my age, right? And he's he's got a young girlfriend, and he's strumming a fucking guitar to show you how beautifully his arthritis drug works. Like, no, I want a law banning guitars. So. So for, for just as, a, as one small aside to this, and uh, it's just how my subconscious works, uh, I always turn tell the sound off when an uh, ad comes. Yeah, I found myself doing that. I think a lot of the manipulation is jammed into the audio track. It is, absolutely. And the way they raise the, uh, the volume of it, they, 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 they raise it above the, the base level so that you can hear it when you're in the kitchen getting a sandwich. Yeah, they couple, blare couple them out. is all it takes. Yeah, to follow you into the next room. That's right. You can't even pee in peace. <laughs> okay, so let's now that we're here, and we, uh, this is one of the best. Con uh, obviously, this not <laughs> that much of a compliment. There's it's not fun. a lot of places it's, to have it's this a fun dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're so we're now we're now on this line between TV and and digital. Now, if we could just for a moment, let's if we can consider one thing. Uh, I was going to say Dylan. No, not Dylan. Uh, Marshall said somewhere that the Vietnam War protests were provoked by television, right? by the instantaneous involvement uh, invitation of, of electrical media. Or, or was, as uh, he might have put it, not his favorite analogy, 
He would call television the cold medium that demands participation. Okay. So we're going to come back to hot and cold in a second, but yes, a cold medium, and they're putting a hot war in a cold medium that probably demanded more participation. Yes. And then suddenly the kids are marching and, and they're, and, and they're putting daisies in the flat and the guns of, <laughs> of soldiers. Perfect TV yes. image. I, I'm old enough to remember the Dow chemical protests at UW Madison. So Dow yes. chemical protests at Ma very, Madison. Very famous. Uh, it was trying to stop uh, Dow chemical from recruiting on campuses and wound up in a massive uh, tear gas uh, riot. So yes, I, <laughs> probably I, with I, I, tear I, gas I made by Dow chemical. Probably there you go. Right. <laughs> they maybe insisted that if you're going to shoot those students, you've got to use a Dow chemical product. Uh -huh. And after all, it's the best CN gas ever made. Okay. So, so we know about uh, electrical media that it provokes instantaneous involvement. Right. At a spirit, at a psychological, you don't like the word spiritual for this. I think of it as spiritual. Fine. But when you say psychological, you mean the na of the nature of the soul. And what I read in McLuhan is he's saying that the cost of that instantaneous involvement is invasion of the private space of the self and the ripping it outside of us and right. the externalization of the imagination. We are hijacked. We're, we're hijacked and manipulated, and we're increasingly pissed off about it. Um, there is no manipulation index that I'm aware of. However, the PR firm Adelson does have a trust index. Ah. And, that, and that trust bar, trust barometer, I think they call it rather, that trust barometer is a fascinating thing to follow. It's, they've been rigorous about this and they've been doing it for a long enough time period that you can basically watch trust fall out of the bottom. And that that is... The other side of that coin is the increasing recognition at a subconscious level, often not. I mean, trust is, is going to be something which is a, a conscious decision. You're asked a question, and you have to give an answer. So it's a survey. That's not a subconscious phenomenon. That, that's a conscious uh, polling phenomenon. But underneath that, there is a subconscious that is completely up in arms. How dare you? How dare you treat me this way? How, how dare you rip my guts out? And then saute them, and uh, uh, and and figure out uh, how you're going to serve them back to us. It, the reason on the trust index survey itself, people are angry about the survey. No, they're they're angry about what the media has done to them. Ang angry about what so it's divided into media, politicians, and and so forth. You, education, every category has collapsed. And and after uh, COVID, the medical category has collapsed. So there's, there's something close to a real-time uh, measurement, such as that is, of our anger uh, over being um, manipulated and, um, and, uh, and driven crazy. I mean, the, the, uh, the amount of drugs being handed out on college campuses today, the amount of anti-anxiety uh, medicines, the amount of depressions, the amount of suicides. We, we have um, a couple of generations, last two generations, typically called Gen Z and millennial, they're out of their minds. I would agree with that. People well, seem really, really crazy. And I'll tell you when I noticed it go uh, like exponential was when the iPhone came out. Okay. That makes uh, sense. I, I, I used to do a nude photo project called Book of Blue, which I was remember. going absolutely swimmingly until the girls all had iPhones. And when they had iPhones, they started becoming paranoid and what I call pornophobic when they were the ones taking pictures of their junk and texting it to people. I wasn't doing that. They were doing that. But once the iPhone came out, suddenly everything in their minds was, what, what, was pornography. Yeah, was, there a, was there a sexting before the iPhone? Well, there, there was um, phone sex called yes. you would say and now i'm doing this to you and if yes. i was there now i would do that to you so that south park spoofs this brilliantly yeah. um with the cooking show they do they they translate this all into cooking shows and the guy's a cooking show addict and his wife pulls the plug on the cable channels and then he's calling up the 1900 numbers and i, I would saute the shit out of that thing and i would deglaze <laughs> that pan 
<laughs> um, uh, it shows oh. you how the content can be like, yeah, put whatever else, whatever you want into that. That's right. Okay, well, so, so, so think different turns into take a picture of your junk. Think junk. different. The Mac, the original Apple slogan yes. from the Super Bowl ad. Yes. With Big Brother on the screen. It's all the end is written in the beginning becomes text your junk to each other and don't trust artists. Correct. That's implicit in there. Yes. Because it, it, it ended the project. The girls were so crazy. They were so unreliable and untrustworthy and paranoid, which they had not been. Right. It was a sad thing. And I was really, I watched it happen before my eyes and I had, it took me time to figure out what, what took me meeting Andrew McLuhan to, figure out what it was <laughs> okay so um i, I want to try to keep a little focus here and we, we're good at yeah, doing I'd, I'd like to, uh, tangents before too long here we've been we're okay on for an hour and a half so yeah yeah your, your Though, audience, I, i'm sure that people forward. are going to love this okay good. so what why don't we um let's talk about the uh what, what we do in this world of illusions and people now being angry that they've they've been fed illusions and wrap up on this point, but there is a disembodied anger because we have been we've been induced into almost total disembodiment, and now people are the last remaining shred of humanity in them is the one that's waking up to the other ninety nine parts that were taken away. What happens? What happens is something called subsidiarity. What happens is, and if you look it up, you'll find a Catholic definition and a, a secular definition, but they amount to the same thing, is that we have already figured out that it makes no difference who's president. We, we've already figured out that voting is, is a big giant scam. Who, who, who the hell cares about voter fraud? The whole thing is a fraud. Yeah. And We've already figured out various ways, pop music and, and on and on and on that are being manipulated. And so the only path out of that is for us to ask the question, what does it mean to be human? And answer that question, it means to be responsible for those things that you can actually be involved with. The social dimensions, social media, of course, implies no responsibilities. It, it implies nothing but more manipulation. And so this is, um, to so many people, so clearly not the way to go. Um, I use Facebook because I have uh, a thousand left wing and a thousand right wing uh, <laughs> friends, and, and I want to know what they say. <laughs> so so for me, it's a, it's a really... Uh, cheap, you know, five <laughs> minutes a day. It's Andy. I, it's Andy, but <laughs> I almost never post on it. Um, I, I will say the same thing over and over again, as I have for many years um, uh, for birthday wishes. Uh, have some digital life on your birthday. A um, uh, couple thousand people get that message. No one yet has said, what exactly do you mean by a digital life? because it's something really quite different. A digital life turns out to be far more local than it is global. Globalism has collapsed, everybody knows that. Uh, Davos and um, uh, Bilderberg are just a joke. Anybody who goes to these things is, is like, why am I wasting my time? Other than I like to hang out with rich people or, or famous people, because these people can't do anything, don't understand anything. So we, we've come to this juncture, as indicated by the trust barometer, where we must reclaim our guts. We, we've got to not, not allow our guts to be ripped out and then uh, fricasseed and fed back to us. We're going to say, no, no, no more, mm -hmm. basta. Yep. basta. I, basta. I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna hold yes. on to my own guts. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm, I'm going to associate with people uh, who I want to associate with. So I'll give you an example here. Um, another friend of mine um, um, has spent a lot of money on what are called DAOs, Distributed Autonomous Organizations. 
I have known about this for a few years. I've known a few people involved with this. It's been a fairly widely uh, uh, proposed idea for how you build small groups of people and then aggregate larger groups of people. So it's a social change kind of affiliated uh, movement. I know a number of people who have been deeply involved with this and have all come to the same conclusion. This is absolutely ridiculous. You, you cannot artificially create a community like this. Find mm -hmm. some people who you actually like, hang out with them, do things together. Yep. Apportion responsibilities appropriately, aggregate with others, forget about this democracy nonsense, forget about all of this um, illusion. I mean, the, the idea that we should all be voting for president of the United States, nonsense. And people are increasingly recognizing this. So, responsibilities flow to the appropriate level, the usual definition for, um, uh, for this uh, approach, the subsidiarity approach, is that decisions are made at the lowest possible level. Mm -hmm. now, that definition tends to leave out responsibilities and some of the other social dynamics of this, but it's, it means the same thing. Uh, there is no real alternative under the AI uh, chat GPT regime, no alternative, but to ask yourself, how can I be a human? In fact, how can I be a better human? And, and that is always going to come back to home. It's always going to come back to the family. It's always going to come back to neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're in the midst of that transition right now. Mm -hmm. The whole COVID effect of, quote, work at home, of course, doesn't begin to address what is actually happening here. The removal of people from the machine, from being a, a Charlie Chaplin cog in the machine, to beginning to get some sense of, of personal agency, and then confront more or less, the family issues you're dealing with, the neighborhood issues you're dealing with. It, it, does, it, it is not um, at all like the activist world under television, mm -hmm. but it, it, it has a much more positive dimension to it. Yep. The critical part that I would like to finish talking about today is the recognition that we are not free and in fact, our understanding of freedom in the negative sense, freedom from constraints, is diabolical. This is the devilish turn that the West took with the printing press. Important to understand that the East did not make that same turn. Logographic um, writing systems, like the Chinese, are not easy to print. Mm -hmm. The alphabet is meaningless. Logograms are meaningful. And so the West has taken a turn into the weeds with the print and the electric paradigms. And it has really no alternative but to become much more carefully soulful and spiritual as a result of digital technology. What most people see, of course, is what they call digital is really just hyperactive, in incredibly obsolete television, just running wild. That's the maelstrom swirling around us. As digital begins to take on its own characteristics and begins to shed the electric television uh, characteristics, this will take generations. So today's Generation Z, typically described as the first digital generation, has massive problems with their immediately predecessor millennium, millennial uh, generation. On exactly this point, not taking responsibility, mm. going to sleep, mm -hmm. um, going to Burning Man or something. <laughs> well, they were supposed to be the fourth turning that saved the world. The, the millennial generation... Yes. In the book where generation theory, Strauss and Howe comes from, which right. is in itself in, in, in potentially a diabolical theory, 
yep. a divide and conquer theory right. uh, without clear uh, boundaries and definitions in its uh, pre presentation. Uh, and, and, and whatever the millennials were, are, they were going to save the world. They were going to be the greatest, right. the next greatest generation. Well, that, that, that's because when the book was published, they were the audience that was being sold to. <laughs> so, uh, no, as, as a matter of fact, um, children, parents, grand, grandparents uh, are the cornerstone of all of this, not four generations. And uh, as far as I can tell, um, very few people will go with that uh, generational theory uh, anymore. But the generations are assigned by the advertisers. And uh, yep. Gen Z is in, uh, they are strongly aware of the circumstance they have been put in and are pissed off about it. So there are books being written on this topic and it will only get more and more exciting as so Gen Z today is typically clocked as age 12 to 25. Um, and people don't do much writing about the alpha generation and the beta generations which come after that. Um, but in fact, um, those generations will be even more intolerant, even more pissed off at what their predecessors uh, have not done. I'm an uh, old man, so I won't uh, uh, see all of this happen. You're a younger man. We all know many younger people. Um, Center for the Study of Digital Life, which is the, the heading for this, is starting a university, an online experimental university called Trivium University. Mm -hmm. Trivium is the first uh, cohort, which will be an experimental uh, session that, that starts actually this coming Wednesday, so we're full up for summer school, um, it is overwhelmingly Gen Z. Mm -hmm. And I suspect as we continue out into next year with our four core courses and begin to add electives, that will be underscored as the word gets out. And we are going to be oversubscribed. We're going to have more people who want to do this than we have the energy to provide. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're in a situation now where the sailor in the Edgar Allan Poe short story who noticed what other people didn't notice. The trunk. And managed to surface, both to the surface and, and later write that story. Well, that is something that is rising to the top. It doesn't have to be a trunk. It could be something far more spiritual. Gnosticism is running wild nowadays. Spirituality is not so much, well, I guess it all depends. Uh, um, I don't have time, obviously, to follow all these, these threads. Um, but there's a lot of really popular speakers who are now presenting various versions of the uh, evil twin of Christianity, uh, Gnosticism. And there are lots of people who were um, reaching out in various ways, and I'm involved with some of them uh, on the more positive side, which is to say, you are free to be a human as opposed to you're free from uh, people telling you what to do. So the positive sense of freedom is on the rise. The recognition of being manipulated uh, is uh, documented and very widespread. And we and other people are starting to, to build institutions at a small level that will uh, help people um, learn a great deal more and motivate them uh, to move this forward. Um, these are fascinating times. These are uh, difficult times, but that is the only way that you can possibly get to something that approximates a social breakthrough. We're in the midst of it now. Excellent analysis. Very, that's very informative. Now I have one last question. It's a little more personal and I'll be, then I'll let you go, but not sure. for very long, Mark. Um, and when you come back to Kingston, I'm buying you dinner. Um, I have pissed off a lot of people in my astrology audience by doing a sincere job covering the COVID crisis and scandal. Yes. And I did what I knew how to do long before I'd ever even heard of astrology which is I learned how to document facts and fact patterns and document right. things and collect right. documents and interviews right. and learn, learn and get an understanding. And that's all I really did. And it was a little bit stunning to me how 
offensive this was to people who would write to me and say things like, the things you're saying aren't on the news. Yeah, you must be wrong. I'm like, oh, that's the whole point. Yeah. What do I, how do I, this is largely a baby boomer audience that, that yeah. has had this reaction, right, right. a trust index problem with me, because in a sense, I spoiled the illusion of astrology right. by doing something that did not involve any right. astrology. I completely left astrology out of the discussion or 99%. No one even wants to read the astrology coverage of COVID. They read my scientific coverage of, of COVID and they are angry at me. What do I say to these people to earn back my simpatico with them that I was beautiful till before till this happened? You can't. That's it. The audience They're gone. The audience had their subconscious biases arranged when they were 12 years old. There is nothing that you can say, I can say, anybody else can say that would suggest to them that they should abandon that narrative. They, they will continue to hold on to it. At the same time, as you know very well, um, uh, Bobby Kennedy ha has a 20% uh, number. And uh, that's a, a lot of people who once upon a time listen to the narrative. But he's lying. Every yes. word out of his mouth is a lie. I know I've been covering him for 14 months. From Bobby Kennedy. I've been covering lie. the Kennedy campaign since before it was announced in April right, of, right, of, right, of 2022. Right, right, right. I've had direct contact with him. Many of my reporters have had direct contact with him and his attorneys and his minions who've made many appearances on my programs. Everything, every word out of his mouth is a lie. His job is to sweep anyone on the fence into the center of this, of this false narrative of the lab release and gain of function of viruses, which never happened. He has no explanation for what lab it came out of or how it was released or which it's all lie. It's all fabrication. He should do right. quite well for himself among the people who like the fabrication and who know what a Kennedy is. He is succeeding because there is an exodus away from the narrative. And you're exactly right. When the narrative collapses, new people have to be inserted into the picture to recast the narrative. Bobby is not going to be satisfactory, but he is an indication of the breakdown in the narrative. I, I'm not for a moment suggesting that I think uh, Kennedy is is uh, correct or honest. I see. I'm only I'm only indicating. It is an indicator that the, the 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 narrative A of COVID, the spontaneous release of a virus spread by a bat and a, whatever, uh, and being a um, um, a, a mismanaged, well, th that's what, that's his line. It's a mismanaged pandemic, but the primary principle Fauci narrative, it, for some people, they have to be very brave to even think lab release. It's a big step for them. <gasps> wow. Lab release. Oh my God. I'm almost there. Well, why don't you ask yourself how we know a virus even exists, but even that is a big step for them to go to any alternative narrative. It feels risque and almost so like coming out as queer to their parents. The most direct answer to the question has to be find a new audience. In this controlled environment. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a controlled environment that is obviously controlled and breaking down. Yep. I so, see. So well, listen, I'd have, I, I, I kind of, like young people more than old people. I'm having, I'm actually meeting people born in the 21st century <laughs> and having fantastic conversations <laughs> with them. And they are interested in what I have to say. That's all they're, not, they're, they're taking me seriously when I say, well, since we're talking about COVID, let me explain to you what I have learned in three years of doing this. Right. They don't bat an eyelash. They're like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much. That's the point we've been discussing uh, throughout this today. We are in a maelstrom and there's a whole lot of people searching for something to bring them to the surface but how old are they are there any boomers and gen xers in this in this and, and le unless they were that way all along i, I see would be classified, ah. i would be classified as a boomer you would be but uh 48 is is prime uh boomer time but um i have through my wall street career through the rest of what i've been doing I have been what various people would call an outlier, a contrarian, a whatever. And, and there are many of those folks out there. But 
if you really want to develop a interesting and meaningful audience, it's likely to be younger people. Amen to that. Good. I may put my born in the 50s project on hold, <laughs> which I got the idea from because Marshall said in times of chaos, people retreat to nostalgia. <clears throat> but I'm not into nostalgia. Come on, we're in a great moment now. Memory is not nostalgia. Mem memory is, is, is actually putting the knowledge of reality, the history, knowledge of reality to work in the present. And very much an embracing of the present. A computer memory does not give a rat's ass what that bit was set at um, 20 years ago. But <laughs> it needs to know uh, the, the sequence of events so that it can make use of it now. And that's what we're doing. We're making use of our memory in a, in a very positive and forward-looking direction. We're not anti-technology. My godfather was Norbert Wiener, warning us of, of what was coming. But I'm not uh, telling people to shut down AI. I'm telling them to figure out what the AI is doing to you. Yeah. Yes. Another conversation. I'm concerned about it. Did you catch the thing about the guy, who, the lawyer who wrote a whole legal brief uh, based on uh, ChatGPT, wrote it and made up all these phony cases? <laughs> and no, like, talk about not being shepherdized. And the judge and the judge caught caught him. Got it. <laughs> and they were all phony cases and phony. <laughs> everything was just whatever. <laughs> Mark, thank, thank you, you, Eric. Uh, uh, look thank you very to our much. Next conversation and our next dinner. And uh, I will look forward to, uh, to seeing all of this online. Excellent. I will let you know when that happens. Thank you. Yep. Love and God bless. Mm -hmm.